Susan Lee, and I'd like to welcome and thank you all for participating in this important town hall. I also want to commend you for all your efforts to make this a better world by forming or supporting a charitable nonprofit organization that we believe will help uplift and provide a high quality of life for countless individuals in our state. And your wonderful exemplary efforts are critical to ensuring that no one uh, falls through the cracks or is left behind. And this town hall, we believe, is particularly important because it'll provide you with the information you will need to form or comply with requirements for creating or maintaining a charitable nonprofit. Uh, so I'd like to thank also my wonderful secretary, uh, Smith, and her team for presenting this town hall and my very best wishes for a productive and a very informative town hall. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, Madam Secretary. Also with me today is our division administrator, Michael Schlein, and our charity staff. Please note the platform restricts attendance to the town hall, not the office of the Secretary of State. And as indicated in the title of this morning's meeting, we will address basic res registration requirements for charitable organizations. We'll also touch on the new one-stop platform. I know some of you have already registered online and some of you may be trying to sort that out. So stay tuned for that. And today's town hall will be recorded and the recording will be posted on the SOS website under the Charities tab. Time is reserved at the end for questions. So you may find that your questions are answered as the presentation progresses, so you might want to hold them. That said, you are welcome to place questions or comments in the chat box, but to prevent confusion about the source of information, please do not answer questions that are placed in the chat box. Our staff will do that. And we'll do our very best to answer all of them. And of course, there will be a question and answer session at the end. Uh, please know that today's town hall is provided for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be legal advice and that uh, this town hall is being recorded and your attendance is consent to the recording. So without further ado, please allow me to introduce to you our fabulous division administrator, Michael Schlein. Mike? <clears throat> Thanks, Kathy. Uh, welcome everybody this morning. Uh, like uh, like everybody said, we're going to talk about the registration requirements for charitable organizations. Your organization solicits contributions in Maryland. Uh, it needs to be registered with the Secretary of State's office before doing so. So we're going to lay out the basics uh, of, of that. First, we're going to talk about some terms and definitions. It's always good to get an understanding of exactly the audience we're talking about and uh, the requirements for registering and why that is what it is. We're going to touch on the new online system and some of the points that are very important for folks to know there and then we're going to dive into the what is required portion uh, and uh, talk about the different items you're going to have to file with us to register or to renew <clears throat> so without further ado the uh, maryland solicitations act business regulation article title title six uh, is what we regulate so it's the uh, maryland solicitations act and it is in the Annotated Code of Maryland Business Regulation Article, Title VI. A little image of the book. You can actually order this book off our website uh, at that link. And, uh, to, you know, as, as mentioned already, this recording is going to get posted on our website. So if you're looking at this link and going, oh, no, I can't. That's, if you don't write that fast, it's okay. Uh, it'll be there for you to find later online. <clears throat> so... Does my organization have to register? And if so, when? Uh, so we talk about the requirement to register if you're soliciting charitable contributions in Maryland. So are you soliciting charitable contributions in Maryland? Uh, if you are, uh, you're doing one of these three things. Uh, you have to register and receive a registration letter from the Secretary of State before the organization either solicits charitable contributions in Maryland, has charitable contributions solicited on its behalf in Maryland, or solicits charitable contributions outside of Maryland if the charitable organization is in Maryland. So if you're located in Maryland and you raise money anywhere, you have to register with the Maryland Secretary of State's office. And uh, soliciting charitable contributions is as simple as you have a website and it has a donate button on there. Uh, if your organization is located in Maryland and you have a donate button on your website, 
or somehow ask for donations on social media, some other social media platform, that is considered soliciting charitable contributions in Maryland. So you're domiciled in Maryland, you raise money online, either from your website or through social media, you're asking for donations, you have to be registered. Even if it's only online, you still have to be registered. Hey, Mike, what happens in a situation where maybe I have a charity, um, I have a website, but I don't solicit per se, but I do hold events, you know, have a concert or have some other benefit, uh, and I sell tickets. Does that qualify? So uh, we're actually going to cover that here on one of these upcoming slides. The short answer is if it's done in conjunction with the use of the charity's name to induce the purchase, yes, it does. Uh, we're going to actually get a definition of charitable solicitation here in a minute that talks about this very thing. Uh, uh, before we hit that, though, what is a charitable contribution? A charitable contribution means a contribution made on a representation that it will be used for a charitable purpose. It can be a payment, transfer, or enforceable pledge of financial help, including money, credit, property, or services. Uh, important things to remember, not so much what is a charitable contribution, but also what is not a charitable contribution, an unsolicited gift. For the purpose of the Maryland Solicitations Act, an unsolicited gift is not a contribution. Government grant or government money, membership dues, assessments, fines, payment for property sold or services rendered, unless the property is sold or the services are rendered in connection with a charitable solicitation, and a public safety contribution as defined by the Maryland Solicitations Act. Uh, so we're going to go on that 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 one right above there, the second to last one about property sold and services rendered, unless it's in connection with a charitable solicitation. What does that mean? Uh, that term charitable solicitation is very specific in what it means, and it means exactly what the law says it means. Anytime you see solicitation, charitable solicitation, it means what this screen is showing. It means that it is an oral or written request for a charitable contribution, regardless of whether the person who makes the request receives the charitable contribution. You ask for a donation, you ask for some type of fundraising, whether you get anything or not, that's a charitable solicitation. The organization has to be registered and needs to be registered before it does that. Uh, so uh, the situation that the assistant secretary just mentioned uh, we're going to cover here in this area what does a charitable solicitation include and it includes a whole lot um it is not just hey please give me a donation it is far more than that and the part that i'm going to emphasize here is this this last main bullet point because it covers that exact situation many folks don't think of it as a solicitation uh, but in the eyes of the solicitations act it is and that's the sale of or offer or attempt to sell an admission. So that ticket to that fundraising event, advertisement, advertising space, book card, chance, coupon, device, magazine, membership, and the list goes on and on and on. Tag, ticket, other tangible item in connection with which an appeal is made for charitable contributions. The name of the charitable organization is used expressly or implicitly to induce a purchase or a statement is made that some or all the proceeds from the sale are to be used for a charitable purpose. So that fundraising event, I'm gonna sell tickets to this event. It inevitably, you're using the name of the charity to help sell that ticket, right? You may also say, you know, and if you can't attend, please donate, or you can donate more than the cost of attending. You see it all the time with these fundraising events. So if you're selling that ticket to that event, you're selling that admission to that event, and you're using the name of the charity uh, to expressly or in implicitly induce a purchase, that counts as a charitable solicitation. That requires you to register with our office. Uh, if anything about some or all the proceeds are gonna be used for a charitable purpose, that would require that the organization register with our office. So we're in Maryland, so we're just gonna use the good old crab feast as an example. Charity holds a crab feast. Bull roast, one of those types of scenarios. You buy a ticket to attend. Why are you buying that mm -hmm. ticket to attend? You're buying that ticket to attend to support that charity because that charity's name was all certainly used, whether it's expressly used or, 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 or somehow implicitly 
used to induce the purchase of the ticket. I'm buying that ticket to go to that crab feast or bull roast to support this charity. That's a charitable solicitation that requires registration. You know, otherwise I just go buy my own crabs or catch my own crabs or go get my own uh, barbecue. Um, I wouldn't, you know, I'd go to a restaurant or something. Uh, the reason folks are attending is to support that charity. So that fundraising event that's being held by that organization is a charitable solicitation. And yes, I know that purchasing that ticket doesn't necessarily mean that, that, that you know, it's not a tax deductible contribution necessarily. And just, I'm not a not a tax expert, so don't take this as tax advice. Um, but the, that that contribution that that purchase of the ticket is not necessarily a contribution that you can write off on your taxes. In the eyes of the Solicitations Act for Maryland and the Maryland Solicitations Act, it is a charitable solicitation, and it is something that requires the organization to register. And as we talk about registration thresholds later on the gross receipts from that fundraising event do count towards the thresholds for registration and the requirements of registration, whether it's for registration fees, over under 25,000 that we're gonna talk about later, or requirements for audits and reviews, uh, that the gross amount from those fundraising events counts. So uh, going back to that question uh, from, from Assistant Secretary Smith a little while ago, yes, you have that fundraising event, you need to register if you have that fundraising event because why are people attending that event? Going to attend to support your organization and your organization's name is probably all over that ticket and that fundraising event, flyer, advertisement, what have you, uh, to induce that purchase to get people to attend to support your calls. <laughs> so register now. If you need to register because you solicit, you're going to want to register. Before we get super deep into the registration requirements, I want to touch on the online filing system. And I, I want to do this up front because I, you know, I know a lot of folks as we talk about what's needed are, are going to be asking about the online system or questions about the online system probably. So online registrations as of January 1st, 23. The online registration system actually went live on August 15th, 2022. If you've already submitted a paper application, do not submit another application online. We have your paper application. We're going to process it. We're not returning paper applications. Uh, we're not doing that at this time. And at some point in time, I'm sure that will happen. But we're not returning paper applications. If you've already submitted one, don't go online and pay again. Let us process your paper application. Um, I, you know, I've had a few folks that have submitted paper apps uh, and then they go online because they hadn't heard anything quickly uh, and then they pay and then they're agitated because they paid twice. Don't do that. Uh, we don't want you to pay twice. We don't want your money twice. Uh, we will refund it uh, when we get to that point. Notice we have it twice, but um, you know, don't don't submit multiple applications for the same thing. If you've submitted it by paper, we'll process it. Uh, and, just you know, thinking about where we're at, we're we're a little behind there on paper applications, and um, you know, if if you send something in uh, for maybe even as far back as December, you may not have heard back from us yet on a paper application. Uh, it takes longer to process those paper ones than it does those online ones. Uh, communications, including renewal reminders and compliance letters, uh, will come from the new system for the new registration system. They're going to come to you via email to the email address or addresses that are associated with the organization's profile online on the one-stop system. Uh, they've been coming mostly through email for a while anyway, uh, you know, during the early days of the pandemic, shifting more onto uh, communication sent electronically. So I know most folks are pretty well versed in getting an email from us. Uh, that's going to continue now into the future through the online system, uh, getting emails about registration, renewing your registration. Hey, you sent us something, but something's missing or wrong or needs to be corrected. Look for those from us by email now. If your charitable organization is already registered, do not submit a new application uh, in the, in the one-stop system. Create a one-stop account, claim your record, 
to file your renewal application. We'll talk about how to claim a record here in a few. Um, but the last thing you want to do is uh, try to file new when you already have been registered with us. Um, now we're having a potential of duplicate profiles and we're trying to prevent that uh, the way the system is set up. So if the organization owes part of an annual registration from a prior year, there's a chance we may request to be sent outside of the online system, especially to avoid double payment. Um, if you're missing one or two things from a prior filing uh, in the paper world, you may just ask for you to email it to us or mail it to us so that we can complete that filing and get you current uh, rather than have you doing it twice, doing it all over again. So uh, we'll instruct you uh, based on your situation. If you're filing a one-off renewal, you get, get familiar with one stop, log in, file online. Uh, and once you get through the record claiming process and you get to your application to renew, uh, the renewals online are gonna walk you through that process. Uh, you're, you know, it's gonna tell you what you need based on how you answer things. So accessing one stop, first thing you need to do is create a, an account. Uh, it's an individual account. So you yourself as a person are gonna create an account on one stop. Best thing I can say to folks is the email address of record is the one that you should create a one stop account with. And uh, whatever email address you gave us on your last registration, that's the email address of record. We've been asking for email addresses for several years now and been requiring it for, for several years now. Um, and that email address that you're giving us, that's the email address that the system knows you by. And that's the email address that can go through a record claiming process. If you're creating a one-stop account with an email address other than the one that's of record for your organization, you're not going to be able to claim that record. The system knows what it knows and what it's been told to know, right? And if it's been told to know abc at charity.com or charity.org, and you log in as xyc at charity.org, it's not going to know xyz. It knows abc. So make sure you're creating a one-stop account with the email address of record. If the email address of record should be different, let us know. We can update that email address of record in the system and then you'd be able to claim it. So claim that record on one stop. Why do you want to claim the record? You claim the record so you can start filing all your renewals uh, so that it can apply for the MCC. You can update your profile online, right? You can change your address or phone number and things like that online. Once the record is claimed, you'll be able to view that organization's profile, file annual registrations, update organization contact information. There is a video guide and a user guide that you can also read on the charity homepage that explains to you how to claim your record. That's on our website. That video walks you through step-by-step. Step. The user guide for creating the account walks you through step-by-step. Step. There's a step or two in there that confuses folks. Um, and I get it, it can be confusing. Watch that video, use that guide, walk you through that process. Uh, if you're having a hard time, let the information there that's available help you figure it out. It's there, it walks you through, it explains it very well. That video is thorough, the video is nice because you can see it happen. Um, but um, claim that record, follow those steps, and it'll get you to claiming the record properly. I'd say that's probably been the biggest thing that people reached out to us about is questions about claiming the record. Uh, several folks that you know that have watched the video guide or use the user guide to claim the record and they can't find the record say hey i've done everything in here but i don't have a record to claim number one reason that's the case and almost always the reason that's the case is because they created a one-stop account with an email address that is different than the email address of record in the system so make sure you're creating that one-stop account with the email address of record that's the one you can claim the record with. And, um, you know, when you successfully claim the record, use the charity registration user guide on the charity homepage. Uh, it'll teach you how to navigate and use the system. It'll tell you how to move around in your profile. It'll tell you how to file renewal applications. It'll tell you how to update your profile or during the Maryland charity campaign window, it'll tell you how to follow your Maryland charity campaign application online. 
So that user guide is going to explain all those things. It has screenshots, pictures, and that to walk you through step by step as well. Use the resources that are there. Uh, we want we want you to succeed. We want you to be able to figure it out and do it. And uh, you know, so think about these things as you're trying to claim a record. If you do everything right, you follow the steps, and there's no record to claim. We probably have a different email address or record. We don't want just anybody being able to claim your record. We want the correct email address that you've been giving us for years to claim that record. So a few more tips about using one stop. Uh, once you've claimed that record, uh, there's a there's a template there called creating an entity. Uh, it'll that'll make sense when you go through it. Uh, but you can actually give access to others to view and use the organization's records. So let's say the email address, address of record is abc, you know, at charity.org. And abc at charity.org logs in, claims the record successfully, and now has access to do everything within the organization's profile there, file renewals and stuff. That email address, that user can authorize other people using and through their email address to access that file. So it's not just one person that can do this. That one person that is empowered to claim that record, that one email address that's empowered to claim that record can then authorize other individuals to have access to that record, right? Your charity, you have a board, you probably have a president, treasurer, secretary, vice president, or some variation of those titles on your board. You can authorize every one of them. And uh, why is that good to do? Well, people come and go sometimes, right? Your board changes over time, it evolves. And as long as you have multiple people with access, if one person that does this goes, the others that have access are still gonna get those communications and be able to renew and keep the organization's registration current and going and not have a gap or a drop off in compliance. The form is also built to ask for what is required based on the way you answer your questions. So in the paper world, you have to figure out what form is right. Uh, I, we get a lot of uh, forms that are, it's the wrong form, or somebody just goes and fills out one of everything, even if they don't have to, hoping that one of them will be A, complete, and B, the correct form. You go on the one stop, you file your online renewal application, uh, the, the form is going to walk you through based on the way you answer the initial questions. It's going to ask you about contributions received in the prior fiscal year. It's going to ask if you have a 990 or 990EZ or 990PF or 990N or none of the above. And then based on that, it's going to ask you some other questions about contributions or to enter some money, some numbers from your 990. And based on those answers and a couple other questions up front, it's going to know what you need to file. And it's going to ask for what you need to file and not for more than what you need to file. So as long as you punch in your information right uh, from your 990, 990 easy, 990 PF, if you have one, it's going to take you through that process to ensure that you give us the right information up front uh, and take the guesswork out of renewing uh, that many folks have. If you receive less than 25,000 a year, it's gonna know that based on those answers and it's gonna walk you to the exempt organization fundraising notice form, the form for under $25,000 organizations. And we're gonna talk about the annual registration and the exempt form requirements here on these later slides, but the online registration is gonna know and take you to the right information. Uh, for organizations that have a religious exemption, uh, you'll still send us the 990, you'll send it to us by email, Name changes, same thing, send it to us offline by email. Name changes in particular, right? We uh, There needs to be when you send us a name change, you're gonna send us some supporting documentation. Uh, you can change your address, your phone number, your email addresses just by editing your profile in the system. But if you wanna change your name, you do have to verify that that's actually the name and before we update that in the system. And if you are submitting annual registrations for multiple years and owe a late fee, only pay the late fee on one of those filings. Don't double pay the late fee. Don't double pay anything. Late fees in the system, they're calculated based on the due date. That's on the top of that annual registration form. So if you are if you owe us multiple years and you're submitting them all at the same time, it's gonna ask you for a late fee on every form. Don't pay it more than once. 
there is a late fee waiver mechanism you can request on that form. If you paid the late fee for your 2018 filing and you owe us 19 and 20 and 21, pay the late fee on the one and then submit the renewal fee, you know, submit the, the late fee request on the others so we don't try to make you double pay. Um, but really pay attention to that due date. There, uh, if it seems outdated, it means that our records indicate something from your organization is missing from prior years. One of the other frequent requests we get say, you know, my 2021 filing isn't late. I don't know a late fee. Why it, your, 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 your system doesn't work. It's asking me for a late fee and I'm, this isn't late. Well, if it's asking you for a late fee, it's because we show that you're missing something from before that was due, that something else is past due. And if you're sending us your 2022 paperwork now, you, you don't, probably don't have a late fee, right? But if it's asking you for a late fee and it says your due date is last year or two years ago, that probably means something from last year or two years ago wasn't received. So pay attention to that due date right at the top of that renewal form. If it's not a current due date or if it's a couple years ago, that means something's missing. You want to reach out to us and figure out what. <clears throat> So kind of on to what we're actually going to talk about uh, in terms of uh, what to file, what are the requirements. An initial registration, uh, there are certain things you have to file. The registration statement, this is put into the online form now. Uh, there's an online form. You can't submit that initial registration unless you answer all those questions. Copy of the organization's articles of incorporation or other governing instruments, so like bylaws or charter of the organization, IRS tax documentation, confirming tax exempt status. Sign copy of a 990 or 990EZ, uh, even a 990PF if you're filing that. Most PF filers aren't registering with us, some do. Uh, so we're mostly seeing 990s and 990EZs. If you don't have a 990 or 990EZ, you're, you're gonna file a state form COF 85 with our office. Again, nice thing about the online system, is the way you answer those first few questions up front if you let it know that you don't file a 990 or 990 ez or 990 pf and you're over twenty five thousand in contributions it's going to prompt you to fill out the financial report cof 85 and it's not going to let you submit without having completed that one of the biggest things we run into in the paper world is folks give us the annual form and they give us a copy of their 990n and they don't do the cof 85. the online system helps catch and correct that uh, by knowing you have a 990N if you answer that way, and then prompting you to do the COF 85. Uh, list of board of directors as well, always required. These items are required for an initial registration. <clears throat> there are some items that are more uh, conditional depending on the charitable organization. You may be required to submit these items. <clears throat> some of them are threshold based. And some of them depend on whether or not you actually have the thing it's asking about. So financial review or audit. If your charitable contributions are at least 300000 but less than $750,000, a financial review performed by an independent certified public accountant is required. If your organization receives contributions of 750000 or more, an audit is required. <clears throat> so that item is threshold-based. Copies of all contracts with professional solicitors or fundraising councils, if applicable. If your organization uses a fundraising council and or a professional solicitor, you'll have to submit contracts for all those companies with which you have a contract. <clears throat> if the organization's affiliated with a state agency, you're going to disclose that. And if charitable contributions are at least $750,000, you'll submit something called an agreed upon procedures report um, a lot of organizations, most of them are not affiliated with a state agency, uh, but if you are, uh, you would check yes, disclose the state agency, and you'd only be required to do the agreed upon procedures report if you're also required to get an audit. Registration fee, if contributions received are at least $25,000 or more. So if the organization receives contributions of $25,000 or more, it's going to have to pay a registration fee. That registration fee ranges anywhere between fifty uh, to three hundred dollars, uh, and it goes up based on the contributions amount. So it is threshold based. The more in contributions you receive, 
the greater filing requirements you have, the greater registration fee you pay up to $300. Charitable organizations that collect less than $25,000 are required to pay a $50 registration fee if they use a professional solicitor. So if you're under 25,000, you don't pay a fee unless you're using a professional solicitor, in which case you pay a $50 fee. So annual registration requirements, you've registered. You filed all your initial registration paperwork, you're registered. You now have to register annually. And that registration annually is, uh, is going to include the annual registration, which also now when you do it online, is, is online. So you, you, I just realized I repeated myself there. Uh, when you file online, uh, it's going to walk you through the annual registration information and, um, and you're going to file it and you're going to submit similar stuff, right? You're updating your registration based on what is needed. You're going to give us a registration and it's going to include an update to your initial registration, right? Hence the annual update of registration uh, terminology. You've registered, you're updating it. So you're going to give us new stuff uh as you have it there's an annual update of registration form online the nice thing about the online system is whatever you provided the last time you filed online it's going to be in there you just need to update it update the information update it on irs form 990 or 990 ez if you don't have a 990 or 990 ez but you're over twenty five thousand. it's going to prompt you to fill out that cof 85. you're going to submit your updated board of directors list uh, same thing with the answers for your registration form. The board list is going to carry over. You just need to add and subtract people. You don't have to type it out every year. A current copy of the organization's articles of incorporation and or bylaws, if they have changed since the last time they were submitted. So did they change? Did they not change? If they didn't change, you don't have to give us anything again. We already have it, right? But if your bylaws have been amended or your articles of incorporation have been amended, you'll want to attach those with your annual registration. So these things are always required and they're due within 10 and a half months of the end of the organization's fiscal year. So let's say your organization's fiscal year ended on December 31st of 2022. Your registration information must be submitted to us by November 15th of 2023 in order to have been submitted on time. So fiscal year ends 10 and a half months later between the time it ends and 10 and a half months is when we need to have that registration information. So other items, these may be required and it depends on what your organization's done in that last fiscal year. You may have to submit an audit or a financial review. Thresholds are the same, whether it's a new registration or an annual registration. If you have 300,000, but less than 750,000 in contributions, financial review. If you're over 750,000, you have an audit. Copies of all contracts with professional solicitors or fundraising councils. Again, if you have them, if this is applicable, if it's not, you check no on our form uh, and, and you proceed, it's not gonna ask you for any of that. If you, if you have contracts with professional solicitors or fundraising councils and you check yes, the online form is gonna prompt you to attach that contract. So again, the form knows based on what you're answering, what is needed, it's gonna prompt you to attach that information. That way you don't miss submitting something. Disclose if affiliated with state agency, same thing as always, and agreed upon procedures report. Again, if you're affiliated with a state agency and you're over 750,000, you do that agreed upon procedures report. And the registration fee. If contributions received are 25,000 or more, you owe a fee. Again, 50 to $300. And if you're under 25,000, but you use a professional solicitor, you're gonna to have to pay a $50 registration fee. So these look very similar to a couple of slides ago when we talked about initial registration, and that's because it is, it's the same, right? 300 to 750 financial review, 750 or more audit. If you're under $300,000 in contributions, you don't owe either one. Uh, contracts, if you have them, affiliated with state agency, if you are, registration fee, depending on the contributions received. Again, another, you know, throwing out to the online system again, uh, one of the nice things about the online system is you punch those numbers in from your 990 or 990 EZ or 990 PF, or if you file none of the above, you file a 990 N or nothing with the IRS, 
you fill out that COF 85 if you're over 25,000. Based on those answers, our online form is going to tell you what, what registration fee is owed. We get a lot of overpayments, underpayments. Uh, folks just, you know, you might owe 50 bucks, but they just stroke a $300 check and wait for the refund. This system will prevent that from happening. You answer those questions right uh, with regards to the 990 or 990EZ, or you fill out your COF 85, and the online form is going to get the right fee from you up front so that you don't have to pay another partial fee or, or wait to get a refund. So the, the, the form is designed online to try to catch everything as much as possible. Let's say you're under $25,000 a year. You don't have to do the full registration. You have to give us something though. You have to file the exempt organization fundraising notice form. This is a form that's required. If you're under 25,000, you don't have to do the full registration, but you have to give us a fundraising notice that explains you're out there raising money in Maryland. Uh, hence the name, exempt organization fundraising notice form. If you are a 501c3, it's going to ask you that on the form. If you check yes, it's going to prompt you to attach the IRS tax determination letter. And if you file a 990 or 990EZ, uh, you'll have to submit that as well. If you file a 990N, you don't have to submit that. We don't need it anyway. It's going to ask you about contributions received in the prior fiscal year. So a lot less if you're under 25,000 a year far fewer things that you have to file. You got that fundraising notice form that you're gonna submit, IRS letter if applicable. On the form it asks you yes, no, or pending. If you're not a 501c3, check no, you just proceed. If you are, if you've put in for 501c3 status but haven't heard back from the IRS yet, you check pending and you proceed. It's not a trick question. Yes, no, pending, whatever it is, you answer it. If you're under 25,000, it's going to let you proceed and continue to continue with uh, the form. Uh, in the online world, this functions very similar to the other way, uh, the over 25. When you answer that series of questions, if you're under 25,000 in contributions, it's going to take you down the path of this exempt organization fundraising notice form. It's not going to make you file more than you have to. It's going to walk you right through this form based on those answers to those questions uh, at the beginning, the first four or five questions on that online form, and it's gonna know, okay, you're under 25,000, you need to follow the exempt fundraising notice, and it's gonna prompt you to answer the questions required from that form. If under 25,000 annually, you're also gonna file the exempt organization fundraising notice form. Annually, you're also gonna give us a 990 or 990 EZ. If you have one, we don't want your 990N, it's not needed. Uh, and this is also gonna be 10 and a half months. So, the organization is under 25,000. It goes online to file its renewal and it's still under 25,000. It's going to prompt you to submit this information again. What happens, everybody used to say, what happens if I'm over 25,000 this year? You know, the nice thing about, you know, in the paper world, you're, you're going, wait, I'm going to send this form and, 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 you know, what happens after that? Or what do I have to send? Again, you kind of the, let me just send everything and pay whatever. Uh, the online system, if you're over under 25 last year, you're over 25 for this filing, the form's going to know that. It's going to change to the annual filing form and ask for all the stuff that's required. So it's going to pick that up based upon your answers to the question to make sure you file the right stuff the first time if you move over 25,000. If you move under 25,000, it's only going to ask you for the exempt fundraising notice stuff this time. So it's going to ask for what is needed based upon the answers to the questions that are provided up front to ensure you get the filing to us right the first time. Uh, the, the success rate of the online filing is far greater than that in the paper world. Uh, so, and why is that? You know, again, you know, all these items that we're going through this list of what's needed, you know, in a paper world, you're going through the checklist, you're trying to check them all off, you mail us everything you think you owe us, turns out you owe us something different uh, or, or something else or, you know, what have you, or it's the wrong fee. We write you back and tell you this is what we need in addition to that. In the online world, it's going to prompt you to attach your 990 if you have one. It's going to prompt you to attach an auditor review if you owe one. It's going to prompt you to submit your current board of directors list. You can't fill out, you can't submit the form without having filled out the answers. A um, couple of the things it doesn't necessarily solve, still got to know to enter the right fiscal year in, right? 
still have to remember to attach a signed copy of the 990 or 990 EZ. Or if it was e-file with the IRS, you still have to attach the e-file signature page. So those are a couple of the things that, you know, we still have to return some applications for online, uh, just like we always return them for in the paper world as well. So be sure that you're giving us the sign 990, sign 990 EZ. If it's an audit, make sure it has the independent auditor's report page and it's signed by the accounting, uh, the CPA or the firm. So submitting this information every year and uh, the online form has also driven success with the exempt fundraising notice form filings as well, because you can't submit it without everything being filled out. But uh, 25,000 a year, under 25,000 a year, I mean, you're still filing annually and the form online is gonna prompt you to give us what is needed only and not more than that. There are some exemptions from registration and you can apply for exemption if you do not use a professional solicitor and you are one of the following. You're a religious organization. Uh, by religious organization, I mean teaching religion. Um, that is in Maryland, uh, in order to meet the definition of religious exemption, uh, you, you are basically teaching the moral and ethical aspects of a particular faith. Um, I know many charities, uh, the mission is, is steeped in religion, right? Uh, to help folks and help the needy or help the hungry or help whoever is disadvantaged. Um, but, but in terms of being exempt, it's about the teaching of religion, uh, not necessarily being founded because of a religion causing you or driving you to do something good, but the actual mission is, is uh, teaching the moral and ethical aspects of a particular faith. An organization that solicits only its membership. You see this a lot in organizations. Maybe they're not all 501c3s, but you see this in other organizations that are maybe fraternal or social in nature. Uh, they're not necessarily charities, but even if they raise money for a charitable purpose, um, if they're only soliciting from their membership, they would have an exemption from registration if they don't use a professional solicitor as well. So solicit only your membership, no professional solicitor, you're exempt from uh, registration in the Maryland Solicitations Act. What is a member? Well, a member has to have some bona fide right privilege standing, some other type of benefit of being a member, and they have to have the right to either elect officers, hold office, uh, or vote on uh, certain organizational matters. So uh, you're not a member just because you donate. Uh, if, if, if membership is just based on the fact that you donated previously, that's not being a member. You have to have some type of bona fide right, privilege, standing, or other honor, and the addition, or in addition to that, I mean, the ability to vote on board members, hold office, elect officers, things of that nature. An organization that receives contributions from for-profit corporations and private foundations. So if you're only getting contributions from for-profits and organizations that are private foundations as determined by the IRS, you could be exempt from registering. Parent-teacher organizations or youth sports organizations that receive less than $25,000 in contributions. So you remember that 25,000 number, you've seen that because if you're under 25, you're filing that exempt organization fundraising notice form with our office. Well, if you're a parent-teacher organization or a youth sports organization, you don't even have to give us the exempt fundraising notice. You don't have to give us anything, you are exempt if you're a parent, teacher, youth sports under 25,000. Public safety organizations that solicit contributions only for the public safety purposes. So we're talking about police organizations like FOPs or fire departments like your volunteer fire company or fire union that are raising money expressly to support that public safety organization and its public safety purposes. So your local volunteer fire department raises money to you know, equipment, training, improvements to the firehouse, improvements to fire service and rescue service, things of that nature. Those are public safety purposes. Raising money for those public safety purposes, those volunteer fire companies wouldn't have to register. Uh, however, if they raise money for a charitable purpose, uh, then they'd have to register. So the law differentiates between what is public safety and what is charitable. So there are some uh, recent changes to Maryland's registration requirements. Uh, we talked a lot about online filings already, but in addition to that, 
uh, automatic extensions. You hear me refer to the 10 and a half months. It uh, used to be six months and you had to ask us for an extension. You don't have to ask us for extensions now, it's automatic. So your renewal date six months after your fiscal year ends, but you get an automatic extension to 10 and a half months without having to request it. Audit threshold increased from 500,000 to 750,000. Financial review threshold increased from 200,000 to 300,000. So several years ago, these thresholds went up. Uh, if you can believe it, they used to be 100,000 for review and 200,000 for an audit. So then it went up and then it's gone up recently again. So contributions of 750,000 or more, you have to get the audit. 300,000 or more, you have to get the financial review. Those thresholds used to be significantly lower. Uh, but, you know, the cost of everything's gone up over time, and therefore the the requirement to get an audit or review, the thresholds have bumped up over time as well. Board of Directors addresses uh, requirements. We no longer require home addresses uh, for registration. We stopped that practice several years ago as well. You'll actually notice if you do the online registration form, as you enter the Board of uh, Directors uh, name and title, It'll ask you if the address is the same, you know, as the organizations. And if you select yes, that's great. And it won't ask you for an address. If you select no, you'll punch in the address at which they can be reached. Uh, the way to think about answering that question is if the organization were to be contacted by mail at the organization's address, would that officer uh, end up being aware of that? Would they be able to receive contact at that address? And if the answer is yes, then you can use the organization's address for that board member. And if the answer is no, then that's when you want to tell us where they are otherwise. And I, I think uh, before uh, we move on to the question section here, um, I, I just, uh, you know, uh, plug in again for the online system. Follow those uh, user guides, right? Use that video to claim that record. Uh, if you're using that video and you're using those user guides, it's going to get you there successfully most of the time. Once you claim that record, use that user guide for charity registrations and navigating the system. It walks you through a lot. Uh, most folks that I've talked to, they get, you know, and I get it. Like it's, they, you know, it's a new system. It's new for everybody. We had to figure it out too, right? And everybody else is figuring it out. And that's not always easy to do. Uh, no matter how tech savvy you are, sometimes you just struggle with something. And uh, that happens. But use those guides. They are super helpful. Uh, the folks that have used those guides, you know, I always ask, how, you know, how was it? But the guy was great. It went through step by step. Sometimes you still get stuck and you call us and that's fine too. You know, we want you to succeed. We want you to be able to claim that record. We want you to be able to use that online system. Um, once you get through that record claiming process and you start filing renewals online, uh, it certainly helps drive compliance because, again, you know, you can't submit something that's not filled out all the way if you're doing it on that online form. And the number one reason we would send things back in the paper world is because people would submit us stuff that was left blank. You know, they give us questions that aren't answered, they wouldn't sign the form. Uh, you can't move forward, right, without uh, without having done that in the new system. And, uh, you know, things again to look out for, make sure those 990s are signed on page one or the 990EZ sign on page four or that you have the e-file signature page with it. Make sure you're aware of what fiscal year is due. Look at that renewal date at the top of that online form. If it's from a while ago, we probably are missing something from your organization. And, um, you know, so use that online form and online system to your advantage to help you file easier and stay compliant. Uh, it, it really, you know, it, it's there, it works. And uh, every now and then something happens, reach out to us if it does, and we'll, we'll try to solve that problem, so. Thanks, Mike. Um, great job. And I think you, know, you certainly drove home the point that we went paperless effective January 1st of this year. If you've submitted a paper application, we will process it, but do not submit further paper applications because we've gone paperless. Okay. Um, and again, Mike said the online system is really a very simple to use process. Claiming the record is what's important. So do that first, follow the instructions and contact us if you have questions. Yeah, and that's, um, uh, sorry, I was say, claiming, claiming that record support that tripped most folks up. I can't emphasize enough, watch that video, use that user guide. Uh, it will take you through step by step. 
uh, on how to do that. Just follow along and you'll get there.